reading is from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hello, Avenue. We are very nearly at the end of our time in this letter of 1 Peter. Just one more week to go after this one. And next week, we're going to try and do a bit of an overview of the letter and all the things we've learnt over the last few months, just to pause and reflect on what God might be saying to us about who he is and what it means to live for him in this world. So that's the plan for next week. But this week, we're looking at some of the closing verses of this letter, and they really are a high point of the whole letter. See, in these verses, I want to suggest Peter is encouraging us to live our lives in this world coram Deo, before the face of God. That's a bit of Latin for you as we begin today. Live your lives in this world coram Deo, before the face of God. See, as Peter is nearing the end of this letter, he urges all of us to live in such a way that the God of all grace is at the very centre of our lives. That's what this passage we're looking at today is all about, 1 Peter 5, 6 to 11. And you'll remember if you've been with us at all over the last few months that Peter's original readers were Christians experiencing trials and suffering. So they were being mocked, marginalised, looked down on by the people around them. The people in authority over them did not share their values. They were often being treated unjustly So Christian slaves had harsh masters. Christian wives lived with unbelieving husbands who mocked them. And so Peter, like the loving pastor that he is, has written this letter to help his readers. He wants to help them make it through the trials they're facing, to keep going in their faith and crucially to draw near to the God of grace at all times. So Peter, as he draws the letter to a close here, he's urging his readers, live your lives before the face of God. Recognise the spiritual realities going on all around you and humble yourselves so that the God of grace is at the very centre of your lives. See, Peter's urging all of his readers here, including us today, humble yourselves before God, verses 6 to 7. Resist the devil verses 8 to 9, and trust God to restore you after you've suffered a little while. That's verses 10 to 11. And in all of this, Peter says, remember, you are following Jesus. Again, right the way throughout 1 Peter, Peter has helped us understand something vital in the Christian life. The Christian life is all about following Jesus as his disciples, just as Peter and the original 12 disciples did during Jesus' earthly ministry. See, the Christian life is all about looking to Jesus and constantly learning from Jesus as he patiently teaches us more about the God of grace through the everyday experiences and everyday relationships in our lives. And the Christian life is all about remembering that Jesus is with us as we seek to live for him and grow as his disciples in this world. So let's look at this passage Together now. If you've got a Bible with you, do have it open to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And the first thing Peter urges all of us to do here is in verses 6 to 7. Humble yourselves before God. Humble yourselves before God. See, it's as if Peter says we all have a choice to make when it comes to living through times of trial and difficulty in this world. Will you sort of kick and scream and rage against God and the universe that all this is happening to you? Will you live your lives in anger and bitterness? Or, says Peter, will you humble yourself 
before God? Will you trust him? Will you accept that you can't see the full picture? So you'll choose to trust that God is in control, that God is up to good even through painful circumstances. Now, it's always striking to me that these words on humility were written by the Apostle Peter. Again, if you read over the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, you quickly learn Peter wasn't naturally a humble man. When Jesus called Peter to follow him, Peter was a proud man. He was self-reliant and self-confident. And in the Gospels, Peter had a glorious plan for Jesus' life and a glorious plan for his own life. Peter would say to Jesus, you're the Messiah, Jesus. You're the Son of God. Therefore, your life should be one of luxury and honour and ease. And since I'm following you, Jesus, well, maybe then my life should be one of luxury and honour and ease. But you see, the problem with Peter's plan for Jesus' life in the Gospels was this. Well, Jesus kept taking Peter's plan and just ripping it up. See, instead of glory, Jesus chose suffering. Instead of luxury, Jesus chose to humble himself. Instead of honour, Jesus chose to die on a cross And Jesus insisted that anyone who followed him, including Peter, should take up their cross too. See, Peter quickly came to realise something. A life lived for Jesus is a life where Jesus is in control and not us. Therefore, Peter urges us here, stop trying to be in charge of your life. Stop trying to be in control. Instead, humble yourselves before God. And of course, humbling yourself before anyone is hard. It's difficult, scary even. How can I know that this person has my best interests at heart? Well, that's why Peter works hard in these short verses to show us just who the God is that we're to humble ourselves before. And the first thing Peter wants to see here is he is the God who saves us. That's verse six. I mean, listen again to the phrase Peter uses to describe God. In verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Now, that's a phrase that appears a lot in the Old Testament accounts of the Exodus from Egypt, the moment when God stepped in and rescued the ancient Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So, for instance, Exodus chapter 13, verse 9, For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. See, by using that phrase, Peter wants to remind his readers just who their God is. He is the God who saves us. He is our rescuer, our saviour, our protector. And as a result, to place yourself under his mighty hand is actually to place yourself in the safest place it is possible to be. The God we're to humble ourselves before is the God who saves us. And more than that, verse 7 The God we're to humble ourselves before is the God who cares for us. Let me read verse 7 aloud for us. Cast all your anxiety on him, says Peter, because he cares for you. I want us to say this is one of the most precious commands, one of the most precious promises anywhere in Scripture. And I'm convinced that Peter chooses his words carefully here. See, verse 7, Peter could have written, cast all your anxiety on him because he loves you. And that will be gloriously true. But instead, he writes, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, Peter wants to emphasize the personal care the God who made the universe has for each one of his anxious people. You see, an anxious Christian might be tempted to say to themselves, well, of course God loves me in that big picture way. You know, he, he sent Jesus to die for me, but, but does he really care about me? Does he really be, care about the, the details of my life, the things that matter to me? And amazingly, Peter's answer in verse 7 is, yes, the God who made the universe cares for you. You matter 
to him. And he invites you to bring all your anxiety, all the things that worry you and weigh you down to him and to cast it on to him. See, in verse 7, Peter likens our anxieties to a terrible weight that we're not able to carry. And Peter knows that our anxieties sometimes feel like they're big enough to, to separate us from God. We say to ourselves, well, how can I be a Christian when I feel so overwhelmed by life? How can I go anywhere near God when I'm so full of fear and worry? But Peter tells us in verse 7, our anxiety doesn't separate us from God. No, instead, he said, see your anxieties as an invitation to draw near to God. See, experiencing anxiety doesn't drive us away from God. No, it should drive us closer to God. God, this is too much for me. Father, help me. Father, I can't cope with this. Father, this is beyond me. And without your help, I'm not going to make it. But then Peter says, when you're anxious, when you feel overwhelmed, go to God. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It's a glorious invitation here. We can be honest with God about the things that overwhelm us. We don't have to carry them on our own. We were never meant to. God is the one who carries our anxieties for us. So humble yourself before him. Peter tells us, humble yourself before the God who saves us, before the God who cares for us. And thirdly, humble yourself before the God who will lift you up in due time. That's verse 6 again. See, in verse 6, Peter's reminding us, if you like, of the shape of the Christian life. Humble yourself now and God will lift you up later. And the reason why that's the shape of the Christian life is that it was the shape of Jesus' life here on earth. See, when Peter calls on us to humble ourselves before God, again, he is calling on us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Remember how Jesus described in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. And it's the same shape of life for everyone who follows Jesus in this world. Suffering now, glory later. Die to yourself now, rise again later. The way of the cross now, the way of the resurrection later. See, Peter's been clear throughout this letter. Following Jesus in this world will always involve suffering and sacrifice here and now. But in verse 6, Peter lifts our eyes to the future. He says any suffering and sacrifice we experience in our lives today is simply not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed in us when God lifts us up in due time. And as you wait for that day, Peter says, humble yourselves before God. So what practical steps can we take to grow in humbling ourselves before God? Well, just a few suggestions here. First of all, get to know God. Get to know the God who saves you, who cares for you, who will lift you up in due time. Make it the business of your life to grow in your love and knowledge of the God of grace. Listen to his voice in his word, the Bible. Ask God to show you more of himself as you read. Okay, we always need to remember the Bible, it's not just a dry book. It's not just a set of doctrines or truths about God. No, the Bible is a love letter written by the God of grace to us to show us how deeply he loves us, to show us how much we matter to him and to show us just how trustworthy he is, all that he has done to rescue us from sin and death and bring us into his family. So get to know this God. And as you get to know him, you will humble yourself before him. You will trust him. And another practical thing we can do is learn to cast your anxiety on him day by day. That's not a once for all thing. That's a daily discipline. Every day our anxieties will rush at us, things that are beyond us. But Peter tells us here, 
Humble yourselves by casting your anxieties on him. Stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to live as if you were God. Instead, humble yourself before God by asking him to help you. And Peter's confident as we do that, as we day by day cast our anxieties on God, we will learn just how deeply he cares for us. And in all of this, these attempts to humble ourselves before God, remember, by humbling yourself before him, you're following in the footsteps of Jesus. So look to Jesus, learn from Jesus and ask Jesus to help you. In verses six to seven then, Peter's urging us to to humble ourselves before God, to place our trust in the God of grace. I said verse seven is such a precious verse in scripture, but I guess it, it can sound a bit like a cat poster. It's one of these sort of beautiful verses that might suggest, oh yeah, the Christian life is one of blissful freedom from anxiety. Well, if that's what we think, then actually verse eight, Peter brings us back down to earth with a bump. Let me read verse eight for us again. Peter writes, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, if these verses are Peter urging us to live before the face of God, then verses eight to nine reminds us that God has an enemy and he is an enemy who is committed to destroying our faith, to destroying us. And his name is the devil. So Peter urges us in verses eight to nine, resist him, resist the devil. Again, I hope you can see in verses eight to nine, Peter's using much more active language than he did in verses six to seven. He says, be alert and of sober mind, stand firm in the faith. See, Peter wants to see here, every Christian, every church family lives their lives in the midst of a spiritual war where we each have a terrible enemy, the devil. Now, it's interesting to note, this is the first and only time the devil's mentioned by name in this letter. See, unlike us, the the biblical writers like Peter are never obsessed with the devil. They're much more interested in worshipping the God of grace. But throughout 1 Peter, the Christians Peter's writing to are experiencing trials and opposition. So here, at the end of the letter, Peter reminds us the devil is the one who stands behind those trials and oppositions. Peter describes the devil here as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrifying description. We have an enemy, says Peter. And make no mistake, he is out to get us. So how do we respond to the devil? Well, Peter doesn't mess about here. Be alert, he says. The devil's out to deceive you, to make you question God's goodness, to turn you away from following Jesus. So be on your guard against him. Resist him, Peter says. How do we do that? Well, by standing firm in the faith, says Peter. Stand firm in the true grace of God. Stand firm in the gospel. The best way of seeing through the lies of the devil is by reminding yourself of the truth of who God is. And finally, remember that you are not alone. That's verse 9. Peter writes, you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. See, contrary to what the devil might whisper at you, experiences of suffering and difficulty, they don't mean God doesn't love you. Quite the opposite, actually. Suffering as a Christian is actually the proof that you belong to Jesus, that God loves you. So remember, you're not alone. See, the devil always tries to isolate us in our suffering. He whispers to us, no one else is suffering like you. Everyone else has it easy compared to you. You're being singled out by God for suffering. But Peter's response in verse 9, you're not alone when you suffer as a Christian. 
You're part of the global people of God who all know something of the sacrifice and suffering of living for Jesus in this world. So resist the devil, reject his lies, take your stand against him, knowing that thanks to Jesus, the devil has no real power over you anymore. So what does resisting the devil look like in practice? Well, just two suggestions. To resist the devil, we can learn from Jesus' example how to resist him. Again, read over the accounts of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. How did Jesus resist the devil's attacks? Well, he used God's word to help him stand firm in the faith. When the devil hinted that God the Father didn't care for Jesus, Jesus said, no, I know in his word he does. I know in his word he'll provide for me, he'll protect me. So get to know scripture, soak yourself in scripture and you will stand firm in the faith. And the other practical way of resisting the devil is through prayer. Pray for yourself and pray for other believers. Again, Peter uses the identical words in verse 8 as he did in chapter 4 and verse 7. Back then he said, be alert and of sober mind. Why? So you may pray. See, in the war raging around us all, we need to pray. We need the grace of God and the strength of God to keep going. So Peter urges us here, pray for yourself and pray for your fellow believers. Whether those believers you know personally or those throughout the world, we all need prayer. We all need God's grace. So resist the devil by praying to God for his protection and for his strength. Now Peter ends this section of the letter by bringing us back to the face of God. Yes, he says, we're in a spiritual war. Yes, we have an enemy who's out to get us. But if we are trusting in Jesus and in his saving death for us, we can be confident of one thing. We are on the winning side of this war. And the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Just look again at verses 10 to 11 as Peter finishes this bit. And notice how Peter describes the God of all grace here. Now, he doesn't write this description as if it's a wish. I mean, wouldn't it be great if God was like this? He doesn't even write it as a prayer. No, verses 10 to 11 are a promise. They are a promise to anyone who humbles themselves before God and who resists the devil. Trust God to restore you after you have suffered a little while, says Peter. Trust in God's restoring grace. Now we often find ourselves asking the question in these days, a question that the biblical writers often asked, how long, O Lord? We ask it about COVID. How long will this pandemic last? How long until we get to see family and friends again? But we also ask it just about our experience of life in a fallen world. How long am I going to struggle with this sin? How long am I going to suffer with with this illness? Well, the answer Peter gives us to that question is the same answer he gave right at the beginning of this letter in chapter 1 and verse 6. How long will our suffering and struggle last? Peter's answer, for a little while. 1 Peter 1 verse 6, now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And then verse 10 of chapter 5, God called you to his eternal glory after you have suffered a little while. Now that might sound like a frustratingly vague answer to the question. We might want a more definite time scale for when our sufferings will be over. But Peter is actually being very clear with us. Your trials will be short lived. Your sufferings and struggles as a Christian will not last forever. God will put things right in the end. God himself will restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. And that is a precious promise. I wonder how many of Peter's original readers would have felt strong, firm and steadfast. I suspect very few of them. This is a marginalised group. All the power around them seems to belong to the Roman emperor. And yet, verse 11... Peter reminds them, to him, to God, be the power forever and ever. Not to Caesar, 
not to Peter and the other apostles, not to any Christian in and of themselves. No, all power belongs to the God of grace. And he promises to use his power to help his people. So take heart, Christians. What does Peter want his readers to understand here? Well, very simply, he wants us to see that the God of grace doesn't give up on his people. God is a God of restoring grace. And that's something Peter came to know in a powerful way in his own life. Again, think back to the life of Peter in the Gospels. We've already referred to it. Peter, he's this leader among the 12 disciples. He's one of Jesus' closest friends. He has seen Jesus do amazing things. He heard Jesus teach day by day for three years. But then, at the moment when Jesus seemed to need him the most, the moment of his arrest and trial, well, Peter just ran away. Peter abandoned Jesus. He denied even knowing Jesus three times to save his own skin. And when Peter realized just how profoundly he'd failed Jesus, but we're told he wept bitterly. For Peter, the story was over. When Jesus died on the cross, not only was Jesus' story over for Peter, his own story was over. Peter would have felt he would now be haunted by his weakness and failure and sin for the rest of his life. But actually, that was not the case. Three days after dying on the cross, Jesus rose again and he defeated sin and death and the devil. And when Jesus met Peter again, Jesus restored Peter. Jesus forgave Peter. Jesus made Peter strong, firm and steadfast by giving his Holy Spirit to Peter. See, when Peter writes about God's restoring grace in verses 10 to 11, he knows what he's talking about and he wants the rest of us to know about God's restoring grace too. And I was reading a book about marriage recently and there was a section towards the end that just really blew me away with its description of God's grace towards repentant sinners. And here's what the writer wrote towards the end of the book. He says this, Many of us think that once something has been broken, it can never be as good as it once was. After all, we don't expect used cars to be as nice as new ones. But not only is God bigger than our mistakes, he actually works through our sin, folly and weaknesses to make our lives more beautiful than ever. And then the writer says this, for God, the repaired is more beautiful than the new. The repaired is more beautiful than the new. Why? Because God is a God of restoring grace. Peter knew that himself and Peter wants us to know it. The God of grace doesn't give up on his people. And because of that, we can trust him to restore us after we've suffered a little while. And we can humble ourselves before him. We can resist the devil. We can look to the God who saves us, the God who cares for us, and the God who will restore us in due time. So Peter is ending this letter, urging us, humble yourselves before the God of grace. Follow Jesus' example. Learn from Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Because Peter knows what is our only hope in life or in death. Our only hope is the God of all grace and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent to rescue us and to restore us. For God, the repaired, is more beautiful than the new. So keep trusting in him, says Peter. Let me read verses 6 and 7 one last time. Peter writing, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Our God is a God of restoring grace. Thank him for that. Mm -hmm.